Hello, welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4 Diploma in Procurement and Supply. This is Commercial Negoci Negotiations Module 5 and Learning Outcome 2, which is to know how to prepare for negotiations. We're going to look at the types of costs and prices in commercial negotiations, the economic factors that impact it, the criteria that can be used and the resources that would be required. So the buyer should be aware of the different costs involved in the product or service they are purchasing. So a direct cost is a cost directly attributable to the manufacture of a product or the provision of a service. So a good example of a direct cost is the cost related to the materials used to produce a product. The usage of the material is directly related to the manufacture of the final product. Indirect costs are those that cannot be attributed to the specific product or service, but are indirectly related to a number of products or services. So for example, the admin costs for a company that are indirectly related to the production of the product. These costs must be accounted for and may be spread over a wide range of products and services. So they're often known as overheads. Fixed costs do not vary with output. So an example of this is rent. Regardless of the quantity of products provided, the rent will remain the same, so they're fixed. So I would link the fixed with the um, indirect costs. Variable costs vary with the output. So the materials we mentioned earlier, if a company produces more products, it will require more materials. If they produce less, they require less materials. So these costs will vary with the output. So I would, I would link the variables to directs. And then the total cost refers to the total of all the costs involved, both directly and indirectly. And some costs are semi-variable, and that's to say that there is a fixed portion of cost, whilst the remaining costs will charge according to usage, like overtime on a production line. If a certain level of labour is required for production, this is a fixed cost, and then any additional production volumes that requires overtime will result in a variable expense that depends on the, the activity. Now, price is the amount paid by a purchaser for goods and services, but the cost is the total amount that the supplier has to spend in order to provide the goods or services, including direct labour materials, logistics and indirect costs, also known as overheads. And as we know, those costs can be fixed or variable, which you can see on the first graph. Fixed costs remain the same regardless of the quantities, and the variable ones will vary according to the output. And the break-even point on the second graph is the price paid for the goods or services that matches the costs of providing it. So when you get to the break-even point, you're not making a profit, but you're not making a loss. Changes in volumes and output of sales can affect the cost and the profit. So the break-even point is the point at which the supplier sells sufficient volume of products to cover its costs exactly. It breaks even, neither making a profit nor a loss. Any additional sales will tip the balance over into profit and suppliers will be conscious of the need to reach their break-even point and their sales staff will be under pressure to obtain sufficient business to reach that required volume. So it's calculated by dividing the fixed cost by the selling price minus the variable cost per unit. You can then multiply this by the number of units of the selling price per unit to get the break-even point in revenue terms. And then the margin of safety is the difference between what you planned you would sell and the break-even level. And the margin of safety is often expressed as a percentage of the, of the planned sales. So this break-even analysis is really concerned with predicting costs and volumes and profit at different levels of activity. And it can be conducted by constructing a clear chart or applying a formula. But the break-even chart shows the approximate profit or loss for different levels of activity, whereas a formula is frequently used to calculate the break-even point, and that is the level of activity at which the company makes neither profit or a loss. But because break-even analysis uses assumptions of cost behaviour, there are limitations in its application. One of the most important limitations is that fixed and variable costs change, and those changes affect the behaviour. So the identification of the break-even point is not sole purpose of breaking even, but looking at the various levels of activities 
um, which give us greater importance for the management of this information. So when talking about profit percentages, it's important to know whether the discussion that you're having is about markup or margin. I mean, both of them are looking at the amount of profit that you're making on a product or a service, but they're calculated in different ways. The margin percentage will always be lower than the markup, but the same cash value of profit. So what you can see here is an example of something that's costing £80 and you're going to sell it at 100, making a profit of 20 pounds. The markup will look at the percentage of the cost. So 20 as a percentage of 80 is 25%. Whereas a margin looks at the percentage of the selling price. So 20 as a percentage of 100 is 20%. Now, cost volume profit analysis is a method that looks at the impact that varying levels of costs and volumes have on operating profit. It looks to determine the break even point of different sales volumes and cost structures. And it, again, it makes a number of assumptions in order to be relevant, including the sales price, the fixed and the variable costs and assumes that they're constant. But running this analysis will involve using several equations for price, cost and other variables. And in this example, we can see the changes that occur when cost, the y-axis or quantity of the x-axis are changed. These costing methods, we look at things like absorbing costs, which is absorbing indirect costs into direct costs related to specific jobs processes or outputs. And then we've got activity-based costing we're also going to look at, which is an alternative to absorb absorption costs. Marginal costs focuses on the variables. It involves calculating how much it will cost to manufacture an additional unit once all the fixed costs of manufacture have been taken into account. And this is a useful consideration for suppliers when pricing work. For example, they could pass on to the buyer their fully absorbed costs for the product or service. Or do they only pass on the marginal cost? The difference can be significant. So let's look a bit closer at absorption costing. The costs that are absorbed into direct costs are direct labour, direct materials and overheads which are indirect costs relating to the manufacture and operation. Under total absorption costs, all the overhead costs like rent and rates and premises of head office administration are fully recovered by being incorporated into the costs of the products created. This is a relatively arbitrary method of linking the overhead costs to a product or service. It does mean that all the relevant costs are fully absorbed across individual products. The marginal cost of production is the change in the total cost that comes from making or producing one item. And the purpose of analysing marginal cost is to determine at what point an organisation can achieve economies of scale. The marginal cost of production calculation is most often used among manufacturers as a means of isolating an optimal production level. Manufacturers are often um, asked to examine the cost of adding one more unit to their production scheme. And this is because at some point the benefit of producing one more additional unit and generating revenue from that unit will bring the overall cost of producing that line item down. And the key of optimising manufacturing costs is to find that point of, or that level as quickly as possible. Marginal cost of production will include all the costs that vary with the level of production. So if a company builds a new factory in order to produce more goods, the cost of building the factory is a marginal cost. The amount of marginal cost varies according to the volume of the goods being produced. Activity-based costing is an alternative to the absorption costs. This is an approach where overheads are allocated 
Um, and it's considered that how the underlying activities that enable the products or service to be delivered are apportioned across the products or departments. And it's based on usage, so the cost relating to the organisation's centralised procurement department should be allocated across individual business units based on the precise amount of time procurement staff spend working on contracts and other activities for each of those business areas. This is more accurate approach than absorption costing. It requires time to be logged accurately. So, for example, um, a plastic bottle manufacturing plant produces a number of different types of bottles and makes them on different lines. Each bottle is made from the same material and requires labour to produce them. However, each type of bottle is manufactured in a different air conditioned area of the plant, which vary in size and use different amounts of materials and labour. So the company allocates cost to each line or activity for the energy of providing the air conditioning based on the size of the area used. They also allocate material costs and labour costs based on these quantities used by each line. Pricing strategies that are used by suppliers. Um, they typically have pricing strategies for items and services within category management groups. These strategies are more efficient in consumer markets, but also used in sort of business to business markets as well. And for us, we need to spot these strategies and develop an appropriate response. So let's have a look at some of these um, strategies. So we've got cost plus pricing. The supplier will calculate the total variable and fixed costs. And then adds a percentage. And this is usually based on historical data, so it may ignore market forces. Premium pricing is when the supplier is determined to charge a very high price and it's not connected with any cost structure. So brand marketing is a prime driver for this approach and this is a typ typically found in the early part of a product life cycle or when demand exceeds supply. Penetration pricing is where um, the supplier is attempting to enter a new market or extend its share in an established one. So it's characterised by price reductions to increase volume, followed by a steady price increase. It may even be a loss leader at the start where it doesn't make a profit at all. Marginal cost pricing is where the supply recovers only the variable cost elements in its price. So price will be well below the market price. If the supplier is nearly full capacity, goods and services are often sold at lower price without profit. And then market pricing is where the supplier sells in line with what the market is prepared to pay. The market price may be forced artificially high by cartel pricing, which is illegal. Now, there are two microeconomic concepts. So market mechanisms in relation to supply and demand and the way in which price affects both. And the market mechanism is a term used to describe the manner in which the manufacturers and buyers eventually determine the price for the goods that are produced. So, for example, um, manufacturers usually set a price to respond to how many goods are being purchased and the buyer reacts to that price. And it's usually connected by law of supply and demand. The market mechanism assists in providing balance in which the price sustains both the producers and the customers. But at times the government can control the economic process through regulations and taxation with the aim of pushing the market in a certain direction, interrupting the market mechanism. And then market structures refers to the degree of competition that exists in a market for a particular product or service and different types of markets that arise. <clears throat> Porter's five forces model considers this aspect. So where there are few suppliers, there are less rivalry and prices will be high. When the suppliers enter a market, there is a greater rivalry and suppliers will compete by reducing prices. So we talked earlier about the level of power in the marketplace, um, but in a monopoly situation, one supplier has complete control. So in some countries, there is only one water company or only one power company. In an oligopoly, a few suppliers will have control and may try to differentiate their goods. So, for example, mobile phone producers. Where there is competition, there'll be many suppliers. And where the goods are homogenous, 
there will be no opportunity to differentiate, so homogeneous means the same. Whereas if the goods can be adapted in some way, they could be marketed as a differentiated product. I think this is called heterogenic. And this gives us two types of markets, perfect competition and imperfect competition. Agricultural products like fruit represents perfect competition, whereas car manufacturers represent imperfect competition. Macroeconomics is the study of factors that relate to the broad economy at national, regional or global level. All buyers, whether big or small, are affected by these factors. And that includes economic growth, the rate of inflation, interest rates, currency exchange rates, unemployment rate and protectionism. Microeconomics studies the behaviour of small things such as individuals and businesses and how decisions are made on the allocation of limited resources. So microeconomic factors will consider the factors that affect individual economic choices, the effect those changes will have on the decision makers and how their choices affect and are affected by markets and how price and demand are determined on individual prices. So what you can see here is the supply and demand curve, which is where that price is set. And the point at which these, um, these two lines cross is known as the equilibrium point. Uh, and the equilibrium price is determined when the quantity demanded is equal to the quantity supplied. So you could sometimes they call this as the, the market has cleared. There's no unsatisfied customers and there's no excess supply. And there are a number of information sources on microeconomic factors. These include data provided by the government, information on mainstream media, reports from financial institutes and markets, as well as economic indices and online sources. And the data used will be relevant to the area of macroeconomics that the organisation wishes to study. Now, negotiation plans and strategies will involve four key activities. Firstly, you need to develop and prioritise your objectives and limits, analysing a wide range of objectives and variables within the context of the organisation's business requirements. And then seeking to understand the other party's objectives. These will vary according to the contract, the market, the power of suppliers. Developing concession plans. This will help you to identify the variables that you can negotiate with to reach a successful outcome within your boundaries. So identify concessions that can be made, plan a supporting statement for each concession to be making a case to the other party that it is a sacrifice for you and of real value to them. Build a hierarchy of concessions from lowest to easy to trade to the highest and most difficult and plan to make concessions in small increments. And then the fourth stage is planning the resource and logistics required and agreeing the team roles. But the outcome of a commercial negotiation defines how effective negotiations have been and the outcomes prove the process has been a failure or a success. And for objectives to be successful, they need to be smart. First of all, they must be specific, clearly identifying what needs to be achieved. They need to be measurable so that we can monitor over time how successful they were. They need to be achievable. There's no point setting unachievable ob objectives that can't be met. They must be relevant. There's no point measuring something that isn't relevant. And they must be timed making sure that over a period of time, we monitor these and keep them on track. Now, a variable is something that can be traded within a negotiation. <laughs> so think of a, a negotiation as trying to move a wall if the wall is one brick, the price, 
then if the other party doesn't want to move, the price on the wall will not move. But if the wall is made up of lots of variables, all different from price, such as discounts, bulk delivery, insurance, and many more, the negotiation wall will be made up of lots of bricks and it will be easier to move the wall quickly using other variables. The price could move with it just as long as we, get, we each give each other a variable of value. So the supplier might say, I'll waive the carriage cost, then perhaps you might agree to the price increase of 2%. In this example, carriage cost because it's being used to achieve the 2% increase. But the purchaser would obviously need to establish the cost incurred for carriage before agreeing to this proposal. In the public sector, moving variables will not always result in lower prices, but will focus on trying to identify variables that add value and increase the worth. The bargaining mix is the mix of variables that can be traded in a commercial negotiation situation. So try and identify as many variables you, as you can. This lowers the chance of the negotiation reaching a deadlock because you've got more possibilities to facilitate a creative solution. Now having multiple variables will allow you to package and replace offers by mixing and changing the variables. You must set your best and worst trading limits for each of those tradables to ensure that you don't give away more than you plan to or are authorised to. Concession planning means considering what's important to you, what's important to the other party and therefore what are you willing to give up. The key in a negotiation is not to trade away anything that's, that's of significant value to you and these tradables are often referred to as must-haves. The good trade is to trade something that is relatively low value to you but valuable to the other party. And the bargaining mix and the variables will differ according to what's being negotiated with whom. Now positions are normally the tip of the negotiating iceberg. Underneath that are the pos all the things that are underlying values and concerns that lead to their positions. It's very important for the negotiator to establish the interests and understand the position beneath it. And what is the actual need that is becoming obscured due to the interests? From a business perspective, it's essential that you meet the needs, but this is difficult if emotions get in the way. When dealing with conflict, each party will have a position which they believe is right. The legitimacy of this position will need to be established, remembering that being right can also be skewed due to interests. <clears throat> and negotiators will need to understand the power basis within the meaning. Who has the most power in terms of market dominance, economic pressures, expertise and leverage? This will all need to be established. Now, there are four main individual negotiation styles. You've got the warm ones where a person um, <clears throat> is a people person. You've got a tough one, which is a hard nosed negotiator. A logical one, which is the numbers person. And a, a dealer, a trader who loves to bargain. For any individual, one of these negotiation styles will be dominant in most circumstances. And you can see the strengths and weaknesses and how to deal with them up on the screen. If you want to press pause, you can read through those in your own time. So when considering your own style and your team member styles, try and consider the following. In what circumstances is your style most effective? And in what circumstance would it be least effective? What positive outcomes accrue from the use of this style <clears throat> and what negative outcomes might result as well. Now with regards to the location at which the negotiation will take place, the negotiator needs to consider the advantages and disadvantages of different options. So conducting the negotiation at the buyer's premises can make the impression on the supplier as to the standard and culture of the organisation, the people they will be negotiating with but it also gives the buyer access to supporting resources, including other functions like finance and manufacturing. Conducting the negotiation at the supplier's premises will allow the buyer to see firsthand the premises, equipment and personnel they'll be contracting with. 
but decisions outside of their negotiation team will, can, be, can be made quickly and in real time. Negotiation over long periods, especially during projects, may suit the use of multiple locations as the project progresses and may even include neutral locations to take into account both parties' travel arrangements. <clears throat> and for international negotiations or where travel costs are restrictive, it may be advisable to conduct virtual negotiations through video conferencing or telephone conferencing. Now, involving the right stakeholders in negotiations facilitates our skills, coordination and communication. And the stakeholders in a commercial negotiation may include the negotiator or a team itself, those responsible for contract or implementation, as well as users, budget holders and senior management. Now, telephone negotiations lose a key aspect of communication, which is the non-verbal communication of body language. And taking this into account, well, there are a number of considerations that need to be taken into account, as well as the disruption, which can hamper the flow of conversation and lead to frustration on both parties. So if you're likely to be phoning an individual frequently, find out when it is best to contact them. Have a clear idea about what you want from the phone call. Establish facts, clearly using yes and no questions. Where assumptions are made, write them down carefully and listen carefully to what's being said. Be aware of what's not being said. Listen for moving signals such as, well, what if we were to do this? And then confirm the conversation in writing as soon as possible and close it politely and promptly. Now, a telephone conference is, again, a telephone meeting among two or more participants involving technology a little bit more sophisticated than a two-way telephone connection. At its simplest, the teleconference will be an audio conference with more than one person. But there are a number of advantages to telephone conferencing. You can attend it from your home or office, reducing travel costs and travel requirements. You can involve multiple stakeholders that are located in different areas increasing the team input towards the ideas and solutions. And then with the ongoing advancements of virtual conferencing, the face-to-face -face meeting has had its day. The number of web-based meetings and events taking place are set to rise as travel costs increase and travel budgets decrease. So there are a number of advantages to web-based meetings, such as the access to the non-verbal cues that you don't get on the teleconference, Reducing the cost post implementation. You can share information real time and make use of multimedia visual aids like presentations. And then finally, in negotiations, it's been suggested that there's a physiological advantage to the party negotiating in their own location. In reality, the buyer has a greater advantages by visiting the supplier's premises where problems and issues can be dealt with straight away. But regardless of the location, you should give attention to the venue, as well as the seating arrangement and the room layout. Access to the information and communication facilities. The tone that is set by the venue. The tidiness, comfort and quality of the room, the furniture and the facilities. The size of the room and the number of people it can comfortably accommodate. The availability of some breakout rooms, because, you know, it's sometimes necessary to you know, just break away for an hour so that the, um, <clears throat> the supplier and the buyer can talk among their own team about, you know, what's workable, what isn't workable, and then reconvene after a short recess. And don't forget, you must make sure you've got availability of things like restrooms and rest refreshments, especially if it's going to be a long and drawn out negotiation. So that's the end of Learning Outcome 2. Thank you for watching.